Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 29 of Computer Architecture. Uh, today, we're going to do what we talked about last time, which is memory and caches. Uh, we started talking about memory and cache, and this was the first lecture in the second subpart of part three, which is memory organization. Uh, we saw how there are different memory technologies. Some of them are fast, but they're very expensive. Some of them are slow, but they're very cheap. And we said that we'd ideally like to have the latency of the fast memories. Um, however, we want to have the capacity and the cost of the, the slow, the, um, the cheap memories. Uh, and to do that, what we did is we arranged uh, our memory in a hierarchy uh, where we put the data that we frequently access in a small uh, but fast memory component. And then the data that we don't, we're not currently accessing all our data, we put it in a larger and cheaper uh, memory component. And we call this the memory hierarchy. So in the memory hierarchy, we store all our data in a flash or a magnetic disk. Uh, the recently accessed data, we put that in memory and that was made of DRAM. And then the more recently accessed data, we put that in a cache and this was called, and this was made of SRAM. Uh, and the idea of uh, putting our, um, uh, and the idea of putting recently accessed data or data that is nearby the recently accessed data in uh, close by is that recently accessed or nearby the recently accessed are good predictors of currently uh, of what is currently going to be accessed because of the principle of locality. So the principle that programs tend to access a small portion of their data at any point in time, uh, and uh, this access uh, observes temporal and spatial locality usually. So temporal locality is the observation that programs tend to, uh, if a program accesses some data, it's probably going to access that same data in the future. And spatial locality says that if a program accessed that some data, then it's likely going to access nearby data in the future. So that is why when we access data, we keep that in memory, we keep that in a cache to to um, benefit from temporal locality. And also when we access data, we're going to also bring nearby data into into the cache to benefit from spatial locality. And we actually we saw temporal locality last time. We didn't see spatial locality. So today we're going to look at how we can also benefit from spatial locality. Define a few terms that we were, we're going to use throughout. Uh, a block is the unit which we copy for data from uh, from uh, across the memory hierarchy. Uh, a hit is when we find data in a, in a specific level, and then the hit ratio is the ratio of access if memory accuracy is that hit. Uh, a miss is when we don't find data in a, a specific level and we have to go to the next level to get it. Uh, and a missed penalty is the time it takes to, next, to go to the next level to get it. And the miss ratio is the ratio of accesses that miss and require us to go to the next level. Uh, we also looked at block placement, and we said that when we have a cache that is smaller than our memory, and we're trying to, uh, when, when we need to bring a block from memory into our cache, we need a way of deciding where to put that block in our cache. Uh, and different uh, cache designs do different things. And we started looking at a direct map cache. A direct map cache was basically a cache where every block in memory maps to a specific block in the cache. And we used the the, the kind of a, 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 a if this was if this cache was rest with three bits, we took three bits from our um, our five bit address to the memory, and we used those three bits as the index to the cache. And of course, because we have this, uh, what ends up happening is we end up having multiple blocks in the memory mapping to the same block in the cache, but we can only have one of those at any point in time. So in, a, in order for us to distinguish which of these uh, which of these uh, blocks, if I have a block here at 0, 1, 0, enable, in order to distinguish uh, this block here if, to which memory block it represents, because I could have multiple of them mapping uh, to the same location, uh, we added bits and tag and a tag. Uh, so the tag basically told us uh, the um, uh, the rest of the memory bits uh, for so that we can know uh, a specific cache line to which memory location it uh, maps to, and the valid bit tells us if it's valid because it could be the case that the cache line is not even valid. Uh, there's nothing there, um, so the valid bit tells us whether or not there's something there. I said that what we did is we looked at how to access a cache. We looked at this uh, more realistic example where a cache. Uh, has 1,024 blocks, and here each block is one word, and we're going to look at, uh, and that's, that's actually not realistic for each block to be one word. We're going to look at how to improve, the, improve on this, uh, but for this cache example, we had, uh, we had uh, 1,024 blocks, 
each block was one word. Um, and uh, we saw how we can divide our 32-bit address to access this cache. We said that the lower two bits, uh, because uh, every block is a multiple of, of one word or four bytes, then the lower two bits really distinguish the bytes within a word. So these lower two bits are not useful for indexing the cache. Uh, since we have 1,024 uh, um, blocks in the cache, then we need 10 bits to index these. So we're going to use these next 10 bits. Uh, so after the byte offset, these two bits, which which distinguish the different bytes inside of the word, the next 10 bits we use to distinguish uh, which uh, index the um, uh, the block maps to in the cache. And the remaining 20 bits are going to be our tag. So when we try to access a cache, what we do is we extract the index, we go to the block that this index takes us to, we check the valid bit, if the valid bit uh, is set, we we read the tag and we compare it to the tag and the address. And if they're equal, that means we have a hit. And if we have a hit, what we do is we take our 32-bit uh, word and we provide it as the data back to the CPU. So this is what we covered last time. Any questions about this? Oh, we also a cache misses. Uh, we said that when we have a cache hit, then that's when we do all of this. And this usually takes one cycle. So in our pipeline, we had the data memory stage, which took one cycle, the instruction memory stage, which took one cycle. So if we have a cache hit, then we do all of this in one cycle. If we have a cache miss, uh, then that means we need to go and we need to fetch the data from low, from you know next levels in the hierarchy, uh, and that usually takes more time. So to do that, what we need to do is we need to stall the pipeline until the data arrives from the next level in the hierarchy. And that means that if we have a data cache miss, then we need to install in the memory stage. If we have instruction cache miss, miss then we install the instruction in the instruction fetch stage. Okay, so that was what we covered last time. Any questions about this? All right, if there are no questions, then today we're talking about memory and cache. And what I'd like to talk about today is um, two things. First of all, uh, ha having larger blocks, and second, we're going to talk about writing to the cache. So for the first topic, uh, last time we saw that we were using one-word blocks uh, into our for, in our cache, and this is actually not realistic. Uh, and in 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 actual uh, uh, processors, our cache lines or our cache blocks are usually much longer than one word, and this is to benefit from spatial locality because if we bring in a word. We're most likely going to access uh, other words that are going to come in later. Uh, we're sorry. We're mostly going to access more wor more words that are near that word. So it makes sense to not just bring in that word, but bring in the words that are next to it. And we can do that by create by having larger cache block. Okay. Uh, so here's uh, here's what uh, what uh, that would look like. Um, so, like I said, so far we've seen caches where we each block is one word, and the question is, what if we make the blocks larger than one word? Let's see how that impacts our design. Um, so, this is an example of a cache with larger blocks. Here, we're going to have a cache that has this time 256 blocks. Okay, that's two to the power eight blocks, but each block is going to be 512 bits or 64 bytes. So, rather than having a four-byte block, we're going to have uh, 64 byte blocks. Okay, so these are larger blocks. And now with this design, the question is, how can we take our 32-bit address and divide it in, or, and in order for us to access uh, this cache? Okay, how do we take our 32-bit address and divide it in order to access this cache? Well, let's first uh, take a look at the offset. So here, remember the first, the, when we had a one, when every block was one word, we had we had two bits. Uh, that differentiate the four bytes within that word. So those two bits did not um, did not matter for for uh, for you know different uh, cache blocks. So this time I have 64 bytes. My cache line is 64 bytes, or my cache block is 64 bytes, and that means that the address of the entire block is going to be at a multiple of 64 bytes. Right now, 64 is two to the power six. So what that means is that my first six blocks over here, uh, these first six blocks are 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 so these first six bits differentiate the different bytes that are inside of the same block. 
But since a block has 64 bytes, since a block, the address of an entire block is always at a multiple of 64 bytes, right? Then these six bits do not matter for finding the block in memory. These six bits matter for finding which bytes inside of each block we are interested in, but they don't matter for finding the actual block. Okay? So then the first six bits in the address are not going to be used for fetching the block. We're going to use them later for finding the words inside the block. Though. Okay? So if we want to index our cache, right, we're going to start from uh, after these first six bits. Okay? So how many bits do we need to index the cache? Right, eight bits. Uh, because we have 256 entries, 256 is 2 to the power 8. And what that means is we need 8 bits to index the cache. So our index is going to be 8 bits. So these 8 bits over here from 6 to 13, we're going to use these 8 bits to index the cache. So we extract these 8 bits, and we take them and we use them to find which block in our cache we would like uh, to, to look at, or, or which block in our cache this address is supposed to map to. Okay, now that we find this block, okay, so if this address, if the data in this address was in our cache, it's going to be inside of this block. Okay, so now that we find this block, uh, what do we do? How do we know if, if our data is there or not? What do we check? Okay, so we need to check the tag, but there's something else that's kind of more important because if we don't check it, then the tag is useless. Right, so first we're going to check the valid bit because if we actually check them in parallel, but I mean, logically, uh, the valid bit, if, if something's not valid, there's no point in checking the tag, right? Um, so uh, we're going to check the valid bit to see if the cache block is empty or not. Okay, and we're also going to check the tag and compare it to the tag and the address. How big is my tag? 18, right, 18, because I have 10 bits for, I have six bits, sorry, I have six bits for um, uh, for the uh, offset, and I have eight bits for the uh, index, so we're left with uh, 32 minus six minus eight, which is 18. Okay, so we're gonna have eight bits for the remaining for the tag, and we're gonna read those tag bits, and we're gonna compare them with the 18 tag bits in the cache, okay, and, if my cache line is valid and the tag matches, then I have a what? Right, then I have a hit. So here I'm going to compare the address to the tag in the cache block, and I'm going to pass these two to the end gate, right? If I have a, if the cache line is valid and the tag matches, that means I have a hit. And here I tell the processor that I have a hit. Okay? Now, if I have a hit, What's left for me to do? So if this was a load word instruction, I only want to get one word from my cache, right? So last time, the, each cache line was one word. But this time, my cache line is not one word. My cache line or my cache block is 16 words, right? This time, my cache block is 16 words. Because 64 bytes is 16 words, OK? So now if I have a load word instruction, I'm not going to remove 16 words to my processor. My processor only wants one word. So what do I need to do? I need to select one of these words, right? How do I select one of these words? Right, I'm going to need a multiplexer. So I'm going to take all these words. Okay, I'm going to have a multiplexer. And this multiplexer is going to select one of these words and return it to the processor. Okay. Now, how do I know which of these words I want? How do I select between these words? Right, exactly, according to the offset. So here, the six bits, the six bit offset, these six bits differentiate the different bytes inside of my. Uh, in, in, inside of my block, right? Now, these are six bits. Uh, my, my, my 64 bytes 
can be kind of logically divided into 16 words where each word is four bytes, right? So then my six bits that index, the, that index these 64 bytes can be divided into four bits that index the 16 words and two bits that, differ, that differentiate the bytes inside of the word, okay? So what we'll do is we're gonna divide our six bit uh, offset into a block offset. And here the block offset is gonna be four bits and we're gonna use the block offset to decide which word uh, from among these words we want. And then the least significant two bits, these are the byte offset, like the byte offset we had last time. And if we're loading a whole word, the, the address is gonna be a multiple of four, so the byte offset is always going to be zero, zero, okay? If we were loading a byte, uh, then this byte offset becomes important because then I need to take this word that I just loaded and I need to extract uh, the, the byte that I care about from, okay? So this is how we, uh, we can have a cache with larger block sizes. Is this clear? Any questions about this? Okay. All right. Well, um, well, if there are no questions, then uh, let's uh, let's kind of talk a little bit more about the size of block size. So, in general, if I have direct map cache, uh, then the address bit, if I, if the direct map cache has two to the power n blocks and two to the power m bytes per block, then the then the um, the address is going to be divided as follows. Uh, we always have four bytes uh, per word. So we're, the byte offset is always going to be two bits. Okay, what is our block offset going to be? How many bits is our block offset going to be? So if I have two to the power m bytes per block, then I'm going to have two to the power m divided by four words per block so to the power m divided by four is like having two to the power of m minus two right so we're going to have m minus two bits for the block offset okay uh what about the index how many index bits am i going to have No, not m. M is the number two to the power m is the number of bytes per block. N, right, exactly. So if I have two to the power n blocks, then I need n bits to index these blocks. So I'm gonna have n bits for the index. Okay, and what about the tag? How big is the tag gonna be? So the tag is going to be everything else, right? The tag is going to be everything else. So it's going to be 32 minus m minus n. Okay. So in general, if I have a direct map cache with to the power n blocks, to the power m bytes per block, of course, four bytes per word, that goes without saying, then my address is going to be divided as follows. Okay. Is it clear to everyone? Now, if I have a cache like this, Let's look at uh, the size of the cache. So, how big is uh, how big is the is the cache going to be? Is direct map cache going to be uh, if I have two to the power n blocks and two to the power m bytes per block? Well, there's two aspects of the size of the cache, right? One aspect is the size of the actual data in the cache. That's the capacity of the cache. But then we also have all these additional bits that we need to we need to store in the cache that are not actual data like the valid bit and the tag bit. So the valid bit and the tag bit, this is overhead because these are not, these is, this is not actual data, so it doesn't contribute to the capacity of the cache, but it is still, uh, they are still bits that I need to store in the cache, okay? 
So here there's two aspects of the size of the cache. There's the capacity in terms of actual data, and then there's the total size in terms of the number of bits that I need to represent the cache, including all the overhead bits. Okay. So what is the size of my what is what is the capacity of my cache? What is the number of what is how many data bits will I have in a cache that has two to the power nine blocks and two to the power m bytes per block? What is the total number of data bits that, that such a cache can store? Okay, well, I, I think you, I think, right, so it's uh, it's not m times n, it's 2 to the power n times 2 to the power m, right? So I have 2 to the power n blocks, 2 to the power m bytes per block, so that's 2 to the power n times 2 to the power m bytes, which is how many bits? So it's that times eight, right? Because every byte is eight bits. So the number of data bits that we have in the cache is to the power n times to the power m times eight. Okay, this is the actual number of data bits that we have. Okay, but like I said, we don't just have data bits in the cache. We have all these other kinds of things, right? We also have valid bits. So if I have a cache like this, how many valid bits do I need? Right, I need two, 2 to the power n valid bits because I have one valid bit for every block. So I'm going to need 2 to the power n valid bits. Okay, one bit per block. So what I what else do I have besides the data bits and the valid bits? There's one more thing that I have. What is it? The tag bits, right? The tag bits. So how many tag bits am I going to have in a in a cache like this? Right, exactly. So every tag is 32 minus m minus n, and we have a tag for every block and a 2 to the n blocks. So the number of tag bits is going to be 2 to the power n times 32 minus m minus n. Okay? So this over here, 2 to the n uh, times 2 to the power n times 8, this is the number of useful bits in my in my cache, it's the number of bits that that's, are storing actual data. And if we add these other bits, then this total becomes the uh, number of the total number of bits that I need to represent my cache. So the efficient, so the total bits is this to the power n times um, one for the valid bit plus 32 minus m minus n for the tag plus two to the power m times eight for uh, the the data inside of a block. Okay. So here, a, a one important metric is the efficiency of my cache, and the efficiency of my cache is the number of data bits over the number of total bits okay and of course it's in my best interest for my cache to be efficient right so if my efficiency was 50 percent that means uh, only half the bits in my cache are useful all the, the other half are being used to just store metadata and i don't want that i want my cache to be as efficient as possible okay so here so the rate so to increase my efficiency what should i increase M, right. So the larger my M, the larger my, the better my efficiency, right? Because the larger my M, the less overhead I'm going to have from the valid bits and tag bits. So what does it mean to increase M? What does M represent? Look here. Right, exactly. Two to the power M bytes per block. So when I increase m, that means I'm going to increase the bytes per block. I'm going to increase the block size. So when I have a larger block size, what that means is I'm going to have better efficiency because, you know, in the first design where I had one block, I had a 20-bit tag for every four bytes, right? A 20-bit tag for every four bytes. So that is very high overhead. But if I increase my block size in the second design that I had, I had an 18-bit tag for every 64 bytes, or for every 512 bits. Okay, so 18-bit tag for 512 bits, that is much less overhead. Okay, so one of the advantages of increasing the size of the block is that it improves the efficiency of the cache. There are other advantages too.
brings us to the impact of the block size. So the advantages of using larger blocks, we saw one, it's increasing the uh, efficiency of the cache because it reduces the overhead of the tag bits. What's another advantage of increasing the block size, which I mentioned kind of earlier in this lecture? So when I have a large block size, it means every time I have a, a better hit ratio, right? Why does it give me a better hit ratio? What observation does it does it does having a large block size kind of uh, benefit from? So if I have if I have a large block, right? Then every time I fetch a word from a, from a memory, what am I going to fetch with it? Right, exactly. I'm going to fetch all the data that is in the same block as that word. So in other words, when I fetch a word, I'm going to fetch all the other words that are next to it inside of the same block. So if my program has good spatial locality, then what's going to happen is when I fetch a word, I also fetch the nearby words, and, and, uh, and that uh, helps me improve. And, and that way, if I, if I access those nearby words later on, I will find them in my cache. Okay? So uh, having a larger block size reduces my miss rate because it benefits from spatial locality. If I fetch a block, the blocks next to it come with it. So next time, next you know, next load, if I'm loading a nearby block, I will find it in the cache. And it also amortizes the overhead of the tag bit, so it improves my efficiency. But there are disadvantages of uh, increasing the block size. Of course, we want to assume a fixed size cache. Okay, so if my if I increase my block size without decreasing anything. I'm, I'm basically increasing the size of my cache. But if I want to keep, if I have limited resources, so I want to keep the size of my cache constant. If I increase the block size, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to decrease something else. So if I increase my block size, I'm going to need to decrease the number of blocks. Okay, and when I decrease the number of blocks, uh, I'm, because I have fewer blocks, I'm going to have a higher probability of conflicts. So I'm going to have a higher probability of eviction. So that is going to increase my miss rate. So I reduce my miss rate if I have spatial locality, but I'm going to increase my miss rate if I have a lot of conflict. Okay, so there's kind of a, a sweet spot that we need to find because increasing the block size kind of improves miss rate from one side, but but makes it worse from the other side. It, we also underutilize the block. So if I don't have spatial locality, then I'm going to fetch, when I, when I access a word, I'm going to bring all, you know, I'm going to, when I access a word, I'm going to bring all the words that are next to it. But if my program does not have spatial locality and does not need those words that are next to it, what I would have done is I would have fetched those words that are next to it for no good reason. Okay, so I and this is called cache pollution. I'm polluting my cache because I'm bringing data in that I don't need. So if I have good spatial locality, increasing the block size is a very good idea. But if I don't have good spatial locality, then increasing the block size is going to pollute my cache. And then finally, we have a larger miss penalty because if I have a larger block size, that means well, miss, I need to, there's more data that I need to fetch. And and fetching more data is going to take more time. And that means that I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have uh, a larger miss penalty. Okay. Now the larger miss penalty can actually be uh, handled by various techniques. Uh, uh, first of all, if we there's there's kind of a trade-off between miss penalty and miss rate and we'll see that later on, right? Because if I reduce my miss rate, but then I increase my miss penalty, I haven't really done anything to my average memory access time. And we're going to look at these trade-offs later on. Um, but we can actually uh, avoid uh, this, uh, uh, we can or, or not avoid, but we can actually address this problem via techniques like early restart and critical word first. So for example, critical word first, what that does is if I'm, if I'm accessing a, um, a, uh, a a 64 byte cache line, for example, uh, rather than uh, getting these 64 bytes in order, we figure out which is the word in those 64 bytes that we want, and we get that one first, give it to the CPU, and then when the, while the CPU is using it, we go and get the remaining words. Okay, so this is one way to reduce the problem of the larger miss penalty caused by larger cache blocks. Okay. So this was kind of a kind of an overview of uh, larger cache blocks, why we use them, how they impact how we access the cache, and the advantage of using larger block size. Okay. 
The next topic that I'd like to talk about is writing to Kasha. Uh, so, so far we've been talking about, you know, reading from caches. If I miss, I bring in the cache line so that I can read it, et cetera. But we haven't really looked at writing to caches. And writing to caches uh, is kind of a little bit more complex. And the reason is the following. So here, if I have a processor, and this processor has kind of a cache and then the memory, okay, and let's say this processor comes and ha we have a write hit. So I want to write to this blue location over here. So I'm going to have a write hit. So if I have a write hit like this, if I only update the data in my cache, I'm going to have a problem because now my cache, uh, my, my data is inconsistent across my memory hierarchy, right? So what I need to do is I need to eventually also update this data in the memory over here. And the question is, when do I update the data in the memory? Okay, and different cache designs do this differently. So the first cache design is a write through cache. So what a write through cache does is the write through cache will update both the cache and the memory at the time of the write. So if a processor wants to write, what the write through cache does, it is going to go and it's going to update the data in the cache and the data in the memory. Okay. So basically, if I'm reading, I will hit my cache all the time. But if I'm writing, now I need to write to the cache and to the memory. So what's the problem uh, with doing this? What's the disadvantage of having a write through cache? So the disadvantage is that now my writes are going to take very long, right? I'm going to have a very high write latency. Uh, and I don't want that, right? The point of caches is that I want my loads and my stores to happen in one cycle. So here we are having the loads happen in one cycle uh, because if I'm doing a load, I, I hit the cache and I just read the data. But now if I have a write through cache, then my stores are going to take long. My stores are going to, because I need to wait for the store to uh, hit the cache, but also to hit the memory. So one way we can mitigate this problem is by having something called a write buffer. What a write buffer is, is rather than writing to my cache and to memory, we write to my cache and we also write to a write buffer that is next to the cache. And then what the processor can do is the processor can go ahead and continue executing after it, fin after it finishes the write. And then in the background, while the processor continues to execute, the write buffer will eventually write the uh, data to the memory. Okay, to make sure that the data is consistent across the cache and the memory. Okay, so this is what a write buffer does. Now, the write buffer is going to be small. We're not going to have a whole other cache over here. So if the write buffer gets full, then my, my processor will have to stall. So basically, the advantage of the write buffer is that rather than having the processor stall on every write until we get to memory, uh, we're gonna we're gonna put the data in a write buffer, and the processor will only stall if the write buffer is full. Because then, if the write buffer is full, we need to wait for something in the write buffer to reach the memory before we can add our value to the write buffer. Okay. So this is how write through caches work. Any questions about write through cache? Okay, uh, well, there's another design, and the other design is a write back cache. And a write, what a write back cache does is that it'll only update the cache. Okay, so for a write back cache, when we write, we only update the cache. Okay, and this way, if we write multiple times, then every time we're just gonna hit the cache. Okay, we're gonna write hit the cache. But like we said, eventually, what we would like to do is we would like to make sure that the data, the updated data is also written to the memory. So what a write back cache does is rather than like write through cache, writing, updating the memory every time we have a write, the write back cache is going to wait until this cache line gets evicted. And then when this cache line gets evicted, that is when we will go and update the memory. Okay, so I'm gonna write, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write to my cache, I'm only gonna write to my cache, and then later on, uh, the value is going to be written to the memory when the block is evicted. So let's say I access some other block from over here. 
Uh, and this other block happens to map to the same uh, cache block as the data that I had written previously. So in this case, what's going to happen is, is I'm going to need to read this block from memory to my cache. And to do that, I'm going to need to evict the existing block. And since the existing block has been written to, what I, at this point, this is when I will take this block and I will write it to memory. Now, to do this successfully, we need to track which blocks have been written to and which blocks have not been written to. Because if a block has not been written to, then I don't want to have to pay the price of writing it to memory. So how can we how can we track whether a block has been written to or not? What can we what can we do? Okay, so not the valid bit, because the valid bit is gonna tell us whether the data is in the cache or not in the cache. Right, uh, because because I, I, I have, I have a, a, a cache block could be valid, but it may not be written to. Uh, but but the idea of having a bit to track this is is the right approach exactly. So we need to know which blocks have changed. So what we're going to have is we're going to have another bit called a dirty bit. So the dirty bit tells us that a cache line is dirty. What do we mean by the cache line is dirty? Is that since we brought the cache line in from memory, we changed its value. OK, so the write through cache is not going to have dirty bits, but a write back cache is going to have dirty bits. And the dirty bit is going to tell us that uh, whether a cache line has changed or not. So when I do store word on a cache line and I hit the cache, I'm, the, 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 I'm going to set the dirty bit. And that way, when I come to evict a cache line, I'm going to check if my dirty bit is not set. It means I did not write to the cache line. It means that um, it, 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 I can just I can just. Uh, remove it from the cache to evict it. However, if the dirty bit is set, that means I did write to my cache line. And what that means is I need to be I need to write it back to memory before I can replace it with uh, the the block that that's coming in. OK. Now, this is nice. Having write back cache is nice because we've avoided the latency of having to wait for the right through for for the right to complete before continuing my store. However, now what we've done is now our eviction takes a long time. So now if I read a value from memory and it it conflicts with a cache line that are, a dirty cache line that I already have, I need to wait for this dirty cache line to be written to memory before I can read this value from memory and provide it to my processor. So now evictions take a long time. And what we can do to avoid this is we can also have a write buffer, but this time the write buffer is not going to be is not going to be for the write throughs. It's going to be for the write backs. So this time I'm not going to put the value in the write buffer when I store to my cache line. I'm going to put the value in my write buffer when I evict my cache line. So when I when I have an eviction, what I will do is I will take this value. I'm going to put it in the write buffer. Okay. And then, and then I'm going to service the the read, uh, the, the kind of the, the value that I just read that caused the eviction to the processor. And then in the background, what I'll do is I'll write from my write buffer to my memory. Okay, so the write buffer is useful for both write through and write back caches. With write through caches, it's useful um, uh, because it uh, because I can buffer the actual write. And with write back caches, uh, I don't have a problem with the actual write if it hits the cache. Uh, but I have problem with eviction, so I can use it to buffer the evictions. Any questions about write back caches? Okay. Our concept uh, with writing to caches, and that's if I have a write miss. So let's say here I have data, but I don't have this data here in my in my cache. So if I try to write to it, I'm going to have a write miss in this case. And the question with write misses is, uh, if I try to write to my cache and the data is not in my cache, what do I do? Do I bring it into my cache and then update it in my cache? Or do I just send the data to memory, write it to memory, or, or maybe write it to a write buffer and the write buffer writes it to memory without 
allocating space for it in my cache. Okay, so there's two cache designs. A write allocate cache will bring the data, the cache line into the cache and update it in the cache. And this, I, it could update it via a write back, okay, or a write through. A write allocate cache will fetch the block to the cache before writing it. And this works for both write through and write back caches, okay? So if I have a write through cache, I'll fetch the data, the block into the cache, and then I'll update the one in the cache and the one in memory. And if I have a write back cache, then I'll fetch the block into the cache and I'll just update the one in the cache. Okay, so this is a write allocate cache. A write allocate cache will, if it, if we have a write miss, will up, will update the value in the, will bring the value in the, fetch the value to the cache uh, before writing it. Another design, which is a write around cache. A write around cache, if we have a write, it will not, uh, it will not bring the value to memory. So a write around cache will just directly write to memory without fetching the block if we have a write miss. It looks like this. So it goes, it doesn't find the value in the cache, so it just goes and updates it in memory without bringing it into the cache. Now, the advantage of having a write around cache, so a write around cache only works for write through caches, by the way, right? Because for a write back cache, we don't have support for writing directly to memory. We always have to write to the cache, and then, we, and then uh, when the, on the eviction, it gets written to memory, okay? So the write around cache only works in combination with the write through cache. Uh, but the advantage of a write around cache is that it's based on the observation that a lot of times uh, we might write a whole bunch of data before we read that data. So maybe you go through an entire array and you write it without reading it, and then you go back through that array and you start reading it. Um, so uh, this uh, approach of write, doing the write around is if I'm going to write to the value, but I'm never going to read it, uh, there's no point in bringing it into my cache. Right, I just I can just send the right value to the memory, and then much later when I need to read it, I'll bring it I'll bring it into my cache, and this avoids evicting other data that's already in the cache. So it's useful because many programs will often write a whole block before reading it. Okay, so that's this is here's a quick summary of what we said about writing. So if I have a write hit, there are two possible designs for dealing with write hits. Uh, a write through cache updates the memory on a write hit. A write back cache will only update the block on a hit and it will set a dirty bit so that it, it later updates the memory on the eviction. And in both cases, we can, we can use a write buffer to avoid having to wait either for the write through or for the write back to complete if there's an eviction. And on a write miss, there's also two possible designs. We have a write allocate cache, which will fetch the block to the cache before writing it. And we have a write around cache that does not fetch the block before writing it. Okay, so are these different uh, designs clear? I know it's a lot of uh, words to remember, write through, write back, write allocate, write around. It takes a while to remember which one is which, um, but, um, but you, you'll, get, you'll, get, uh, you'll get used to it. Any questions about this? Is this clear to everyone? Okay, well, if there are no questions, then about what we covered today in section 5.3 of the textbook. And that's all for today, and I will see you next time. Bye, everyone.